Good morning. It's about time for us to get started this morning. Um, before we get started, we are going to, to have a word of prayer. just found out that uh, JP's sister, Melody, has just passed. And so uh, it, he had to step out, but we're going to have a prayer for, for that family before we get started this morning, then we'll begin uh, into our text. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the day that we have and for allowing us to come together as your children to study from your word. And Father, right now we're... Uh, we're especially mindful of, uh, of the Charpentier family and uh, the pain that they're going through as we just just heard that, that Melody's passed away. Father, I pray that uh, that you would comfort JP and Elizabeth and, and Christian and Faith and the rest of the family at this time. Uh, Father, we know this is a hard time for them, and I pray that we as a church would be an encouragement to them and would, uh, that would, would build them up and comfort them in the best way we can. And Father, I pray that uh, that they would all look to you at this time, Father. And I pray that you would go with us through our time of study this morning as we continue to look at the book of Acts. I pray that, uh, that we would learn from it, that we would uh, strive to be more like Jesus, and that we would apply the things that we learn. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So last week we finished up Acts chapter 21. We saw where Paul was arrested in the temple where he was accused uh, remember, they, they supposed, they thought that Paul had brought some Gentiles into the temple, but he hadn't actually. The, the rumors that were going around had a, an element of truth, but in their essence were not true. But Paul ended up being arrested, and the Jews had drug him out of the temple. They closed the gate, and they began to beat him. And the Roman centurion had to come down and, and save Paul's life from the Jews who were intending to kill him right then and there. Well, the, the Roman commander takes him up into the, into the barracks and begins to speak with him, and, and he allows Paul, he's getting ready to allow Paul to speak. And last week we ended our class with Paul motioning to the crowd with his hand, getting ready to speak to them in the Hebrew dialect, but we didn't look at any of what he had to say. So that's where we get into chapter 22. We see Paul's defense. We see Paul retelling his, his conversion uh, but this is after he's been violently arrested. He was allowed by the Roman commander to address the people. Presumably, the commander's trying to use this opportunity to find out what's actually going on here. Uh, because you remember the commander was not able to really find out from the Jews what's going on either. In, verse, in chapter 21, verses 33 and 34, it says, The commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains, and he began asking him who he was and what he'd done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And so all the commander knows is all of the Jews are mad at this one guy, but he can't figure out why. And when he asks, he gets different answers. And so now he finds out, well, Paul, as we saw at the end of the chapter, Paul may not be who he thought he was, uh, who the commander thought he was. And so Paul asks, can I speak to the people? And the commander gives him permission. And so the very end of chapter 21, he motioned to the people with his hand, and when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect. And that's where we get into chapter 22. And we're going to read again about, about Paul's conversion, but this account in, cha in, in chapter 22 is a little different than what we saw in chapter 9 because it's told from Paul's point of view. And so it's told from a different perspective, from, from a different point of view uh, as far as what's happening. It doesn't contradict chapter 9, but it does give us a few additional details. It gives us a few things that we didn't see over there. Uh, and so just because we're reading it from a different person's point of view. At chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, he says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And so Paul begins by identifying with his listeners. Brethren and fathers, he addresses them in a way that identifies himself as one of them. He is uh, a Jew. He addresses them in, in identifying himself as well as showing respect to them. And what really got their attention is that it says he's addressing them in the Hebrew dialect. And so at least most of them would have understood had he continued to speak in Greek as he had been to the Roman commander. But Paul is paying attention to who his audience is. And so he speaks to them in Hebrew. 
He'd spoken to the commander in Greek uh, as a way of gaining rapport and confidence in that setting. Now he's speaking to the Jews in their language. And he begins in, in, in verses 3 through 5, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. And so he starts off explaining, here's his credentials in, uh, in Judaism. Here's who he is. Here's what his former way of life was. And so he used to have the same exact perspective as these Jews who were just calling for his death and had begun to beat him. And so he wanted his audience to know that he understood them. He knows where they're coming from. He knows why they've been beating him. He understands their religion. He understands their motivation for what they're doing. He understands why they wanted him dead. He gets it. And so he begins, he starts his speech off here, his defense off by saying, I know what you're going through. I know where you are. He identifies with them as a way of, of building some common ground. And even though he was from Tarsus of Cilicia, he explains, I was brought up in this city. Because even though he was born in another city, he's from Tarsus, he wants to, to let them know he does not have a Gentile or a pagan point of view or mentality. He's been trained in Jerusalem at the feet of their most respected teacher, Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was not just a teacher. Gamaliel at that time was the teacher. He was the most respected in Judaism at that time. He was regarded as one of the greatest rabbis who's ever lived. This means Paul's words will carry some weight because he's got the best training that Judaism had to offer. And so he's, you know, just because he comes from Tarsus of Cilicia does not mean that he has some Gentile or pagan mentality. That's not affecting his, his background and the way he thinks and what his culture is. He was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of the best. And so he begins with that. His, Paul, uh, his remarks here show that two of the charges against him would be completely false, that he preached against the people and that he dishonored the law. He expresses in what he says just in these first five verses that he is proud of his heritage as a Jew and that he has profound respect for the law. And so it goes completely against what they're charging him with and what they're thinking of him at this point, that he just doesn't really care about the law, that he's preaching out against the people. Uh, another charge was that he was speaking out against the temple, and we'll address that a little bit later on. But they're, they're looking at him as one who just does not really put a whole lot into uh, or, or doesn't give a whole lot of importance to the Jews and to the law, and he's saying that's not true at all. If you notice, uh, well, his education had been strictly according to the law. He had been zealous for that law. And he also compliments them in this section again. In remarking about his own zeal for the law, he makes mention of their zeal. You notice there in verse 3, he was educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. And so he recognizes there is a zeal for God among this people, even if they're misguided. Now, he will mention that if you look over in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. You see Paul's remarks as far as what he sees in the Jewish people, his desire for them, you see what his assessment of them. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject, uh, subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so he speaks about their zeal over there, but he gives a little bit more... Uh, he speaks of it a little bit more directly. It's a zeal, but not in accordance with knowledge. 
Here he's mentioning, as he's talking to the Jews, he says, I can see that you have a zeal for God. He starts off in complimenting them and building uh, a rapport with them. It's similar to the way that he had complimented the, uh, the people of Athens in chapter 17 and verse 22. They weren't right. They were misguided in their religious uh, zeal. But in chapter 17 and verse 22, you remember Paul was in Athens. He goes up to Mars Hill. He sees this is a city full of idols. And he says to them, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you're very religious in all respects. And he starts right where they're at. And he says, you know, there's an altar over here to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. And he starts where they are. He says, you're very religious and begins on a positive note. Now, he's in a very different setting in Jerusalem with the Jews. These are a people who have a zeal for God, but it's misguided. And so he mentions that he, he, he acknowledges their love for God, their zeal for God. He recounts the level of his zeal at this point too that he himself was also persecuting the church the same way they're persecuting him. He was one who persecuted the church. He said in Galatians 1, beyond measure. And talking about the way he persecuted, uh, he had gotten letters to travel to foreign cities to put, in his mind, his goal was to put an end to the church before he was converted. He could even call on the council and the high priest to testify to this. Notice verse 5, as the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the, uh, to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who, uh, who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. He's looking around at the Jewish leaders and he says, there are people here who can, who can testify to what I'm saying. In telling of his credentials and his past way of life, Paul, I think, is here is hoping to gain their confidence to be able to preach the gospel to them, to be able to, to take them say, okay, here's where I was, it's exactly where you are today, and here's how I got to where I am. And to be able to get them to follow along with him because he's getting ready to begin saying, here's, here's what happened. Here's why, here's why I'm preaching something different than what you see. He's working to convince them that he understands exactly where they, where they are and why they're doing what they're doing. And it's a, a wise move from Paul that he establishes common ground before he retells, uh, before he tells them about his conversion. But picking back up in verse 6 and working our way down to verse 16, we have Paul telling about why he's a Christian. Why is he... Uh, doing what he's doing? Why is he preaching to the Gentiles? Why is he uh, going on these missionary journeys? Why is he the way that he is at, the, at this point? Verse 6, But it happened that as I was on my, on my way approaching Damascus, about noontime a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you're persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all that, has been, all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by, <clears throat> by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain Ananias a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very time I looked up at him and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. And so in this section, we have Paul telling of his conversion. Here's what happened. After showing that he understands where they're coming from, now he shifts and he says, now I want you to understand where I'm coming from. And so he begins to tell his, uh, his side of this. 
And so in telling them of his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he is indirectly disputing the official account of what happened to the body of Jesus as well. If you remember in Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 to 15, what were they saying happened to the body of Jesus? Uh, not that I'm aware. Tana, Tana asked uh, if, if we have any idea or if there's any record of what happened to the others who were with Paul on the road to Damascus. I'm not aware of, of any information that we have about them, about his traveling companions. Well, that would make sense that they would, that they would be impacted by it, but we really don't know how they were impacted by it or if they were. Um, but in Paul telling about his encounter with the, with the risen Jesus, He's, he's contradicting kind of the way he puts it. It's kind of in an indirect way, but he's contradicting the official account in Jerusalem of what happened to Jesus, what happened after his death. In Matthew 28, beginning in verse 11, it says, While they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you were to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. They took the money and did as they had been instructed. This story is widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. And so the understanding among the Jews is that the body of Jesus had been taken and just relocated and they didn't know it. And so now they're able to say Jesus was raised from the dead because they moved his body. Nobody knows where it is. Now here's Paul in Jerusalem saying, I saw him. He spoke to me on my, on my way to Damascus. And so that contradicts what the Jews are saying about Jesus. Another aspect of Paul's account, and this kind of relates to what Tana is saying, is that they would be faced with explaining why had he changed as drastically as he did. Because in speaking to the Jewish leaders, some of these people likely knew Paul and he would know them. He was their most zealous advocate, the one who was, who was persecuting the church, leading the charge at trying to eradicate Christianity, and now, he, now here he is preaching Jesus. How, why did he change in this way? And so that's going to be something that would be hard for them to explain. Paul was, you know, he was prominent. He was a fanatic that he wouldn't have listened to a Christian long enough to be converted. He would have tried to kill him, had him arrested but he was still converted. How did that happen if he didn't see Jesus? And that's what the Jews here are going to have to wrestle with. That's the question that's not going to, to be able to be answered by them. If he didn't see Jesus, who converted him? So we see Paul's response to Jesus fell to the ground after he heard the voice, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus the Nazarene, whom you're persecuting. The others saw, in verse 9, they saw the light to be sure, but they didn't understand the voice of the one who was speaking. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? His response, what do you want me to do? Until we get to this point, we're not really ready to follow Jesus. We have to be ready to ask the question, what do you want me to do, Lord? As we come to His Word, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to believe? What would you have me to teach? We have to get to that point that we're ready to submit fully to Him before we're ready to follow Him. We have to get to the point of complete submission before He's going to be able to make the kind of difference in us that He wants to. Here we have Paul who's been convicted. He sees... Jesus, who's been raised from the dead, appearing to him, and now he's ready to do whatever he needed to do. And Jesus' response to him, go to Damascus and you'll be told what to do. There are some things that are appointed for him, all that's been appointed for him to do, Jesus says there. God had a plan for Paul, and he's made that clear in this interaction. He made it clear to Paul, go to Damascus and you'll be told what it's been appointed for you to do. Ananias was told that there was a plan for Paul as well. We go back to chapter 9 and we look at the other account that we've already seen of, of, of this conversion in chapter 9, beginning in verse 13. You remember, this is where 
The Lord has told Ananias, I want you to go and you find Saul from Tarsus. And Ananias, verse 13, answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. He has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Ananias begins to argue with Jesus. I don't know about that. Are you really sure that's who you want me to go talk to? He could have me arrested. And the Lord's response to him in verse 15, He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. God had also told Ananias that there was a plan for Paul. Now it tells us there he had to be led into the hand uh, into Damascus by the hand because he'd been blinded. He couldn't see anything, so he gets to, uh, gets to Damascus. Ananias comes and, uh, and meets him. Now if you notice verse 12, it's really interesting the way that Paul describes here. It's insignificant the way that Paul describes Ananias in this case. The man who was devout by the standard of the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. Why do you think Paul decided to include that in his defense? Okay, so it's possible, as Kate mentions, that they, that they knew Ananias and Paul's uh, speaking of his character. But in this specific context, why do you think Paul brings up Ananias' reputation and his being devout by the standard of the law? Yes, it helps to build Paul's credibility. Here's one, as, as you mentioned, if they, he's trying to gain their trust. Here's somebody, the person that met me in Damascus. Here's the person who's telling him what to do. The person who tells him how to respond. The person who tells him this is somebody who was devout by the standard of the law, and he had a good reputation with the Jews. And so every, at every step of this and his conversion, he's showing how he's continuing to show respect for Judaism. He's showing respect for the Jews. He's showing respect for the people. He's showing respect for the law. And even the people that he's interacting with here, he's showing this is somebody who's devout. This is somebody that has a good reputation among the Jews, and it's just another way to continue to, to build his defense. This is not just, Ananias came to me and told me this, Ananias, oh, by the way, he's got a really good reputation with the Jews and he's devout. Came to me and here's what he said. He came to me and standing near to me, said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And so uh, we see the, his vision was, was restored. Um, Verses 14 and 15, he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know His will and to see the righteous one, to hear an utterance from His mouth. You will be a witness for Him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Ananias spoke to Paul referring to the vision that Paul had just seen a few days prior. Paul had been appointed to see the righteous one and to hear the... Uh, to hear an utterance from his mouth. Now this vision on the road to Damascus was the foundation of Paul's conversion, his apostleship, and his ministry. And we see that in a few places where he makes reference to this vision. If we go to 1 Corinthians, we see a couple of times that he writes about the significance of it. And there's other places in Scripture as well, but uh, particularly I'm thinking of Galatians as well. But for our purposes right now, if we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1, as he's asking them some rhetorical questions. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And you get over to chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, where Paul is talking about the, the importance of the resurrection. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 and 8, before that, he's talking about how Christ had appeared to the apostles and he's appeared to more than 500 at one time who remain. And then verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I'm the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so in talking about the resurrection there, Paul is basing... What he's saying here, a lot of it is on the fact he said Jesus appeared to me. He appeared to, he appeared to all of these people. The resurrection is a true fact. He appeared to me too, last of all. Ananias tells him here 
after referencing this vision, after referencing that Jesus has appeared to him, Ananias told him that he's going to be a witness to all men. Now this would include the Gentiles, but he doesn't go into the this uh, into detail on that of what you have seen and heard. You're going to tell people what you've seen and heard. What had Paul seen and heard? He'd seen a light. He'd seen a light that blinded him. He saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, the one that he was trying to put an end to uh, his followers. He'd heard the voice of Jesus. You're going to be a witness to all men. What happened to you on the road? Ananias says to him, and then he asks him, verse 16, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. There was a lot of things that were appointed for Paul to do. To preach the name of Jesus before the Gentiles and before kings and before the Jews but he couldn't do any of that until he was converted himself. Paul's mission had to start with his own obedience. To this point, Paul has been ready to follow Jesus, but he's not yet been forgiven of his own sins. And he talks about here, he speaks about you know, what happens at the point whenever he's baptized, a washing. But it's not a physical washing that's significant. It's the spiritual washing. Wash away your sins, he tells him. The nature of the washing here is spiritual. If we look at a couple of other passages, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, in talking about the significance of what happens here. Paul, in writing to Titus, speaks about, uh, speaks about salvation, says he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration <clears throat> and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So washing of regeneration, some versions will say of rebirth. Wash away your sins, calling on his name or calling on the name of the Lord. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Peter as well speaks about the washing and what's going on at this point, uh, uh, at the point of baptism. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3, in the verses that precede this, he's talking about the flood, about the global flood about, uh, and, and Noah. And then he gets to verse 21 corresponding to that. Bapti uh, the flood washed sin off the world. You remember the... the uh, Mankind had gotten so sinful that God regretted that He'd made mankind, but only Noah and his family were pleasing to Him. And so God sends Noah into the ark and He, he washes the sin off of the world. Baptism is the point corresponding to that global flood, the point at which sin is washed from the obedient sinner. When one who has faith in Jesus, who trusts in Him, chooses to obey. That's the point whenever sin is taken away. He says they're corresponding to that, what God did in the flood. Baptism now saves you. But he says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. It's not about the physical washing here, but it's an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Ananias said to Paul, wash away your sins, calling on his name. In baptism, we are appealing to God for a cleansing. That word in, in 1 Peter 3.21, an appeal, eperotema, is in the Greek, it is a formal request. It is an asking God through our obedience to take our sins away. It is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. And it's done, as we saw in Acts chapter 2, in the name of Jesus. By the authority of the one who is seated at the right hand of God, we are asking in the name of the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who shed his blood to forgive us. We appeal to God through him when we do what he asks us to do. And what scripture tells us effectively is that when we do what God tells us to do, that he does exactly what he promised he would do and goes to work removing our sin. 
In baptism, we, in submitting to this command, we make a formal request of God for cleansing from sin based on the authority of Jesus. It's not a work that earns us anything. It's like Titus 3, 5 says, not on the basis of good deeds we've done. It's a submission and obedience at which point we receive the undeserved grace of God. point at which Paul went from being still in his sin to now being free from sin and ready to begin his mission of proclaiming Jesus to others. And Ananias, what are you waiting for? Then we get to the next section, verses 17 down to 21. Paul begins to tell the people as he's making his defense, he tells of the commission that he's been given to go to work. Verse 17, it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And so Paul tells of his commission. Here's why I'm preaching to the Gentiles. Here's why I've been traveling around. Here's why I've been doing these things that they've been hearing about. And some of what they've been hearing is not completely true, but they've heard that he's been traveling around and he's been preaching to, uh, to Gentiles. And so he tells of his commission. Here's why that happened. The third charge against Paul is that he had preached to all men everywhere against the temple. Now you remember the different charges and the different things they've been saying about Paul, the rumors that had been going around about him among the Jews. There was an element of truth in it, but in their essence, they weren't true. Same, thing's true to here. Uh, same thing is the case here. He has been preaching to all men everywhere, but not against the temple. Now he's been preaching that Judaism that the law of Moses or that the rituals that take place in the temple is not a means to salvation. But he has not been preaching out against the Jews, against the people, or against the customs. <coughs> Excuse me. And Paul thought whenever God told him, whenever Jesus told him, get out of Jerusalem, he thought, well, surely they'll accept me, given who he has been given this drastic and abrupt change that he's, that's taken place in him. He said, Lord, they, they know what I've done. Surely they'll continue to accept me after they see the change. And he brings up how he's gone to synagogues to imprison and beat those who were Christians. He brings up how he was a part of the execution of Stephen. And I think this is another way as he's as he's making his defense, that Paul includes these things again to remind the Jews, remember who I used to be. Can he? People who have been looking for the Messiah all their life, and he's now talking to them about the Messiah. And that must be in their mind as they're hearing what he's saying. Then, as soon as he mentions Jew, rather than thinking about how they should be responding themselves, they automatically look at somewhere else. They might what he's saying, and they look at their hatred for the Gentile. Yes, and that's what we see is that there's the that, that, that trigger point of when he gets there. As soon as he mentioned the Gentiles, they completely lost their minds. Yes, and that's a good point that, you know, they, when they heard this, it, it took their minds off. They weren't ready to listen anymore. We've got to be careful that we don't uh, have that same kind of attitude that, you know, we hear or see a specific thing and it, it removes us from being able to hear and, and see what we need to. Uh, but we get to the point where Paul mentions, uh, mentions the Gentiles, and that was the end of it right there. 
he had thought, surely the Jews will accept me. Because, and he, he goes back before he mentions the Gentiles. He said, you know, I was there. I was holding the coats whenever Stephen was stoned. And he's, he's bringing back to their attention again what he had done before in specific, a specific event to try to, again, build rapport with them. Because remember, they were getting ready to kill him in chapter 21 just before this happened. He said, I used to be in the same place you were. As a matter of fact, I was part of, of having Stephen killed. The Lord knew better than, uh, than the Jews accepting him. The Lord knew that he would be seen as a traitor rather than the people listening to him, and that's exactly what happened. If we go back to, to Acts chapter 9, we see that whenever Paul began to preach the truth, in Acts 9, 23 to 25, it says, When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. Their plot became known to Saul, uh, and they were, uh, they were also watching the gates day and night so they might put him to death. His disciples, uh, the, uh, his disciples took him uh, by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And then also in chapter 9, verses 29 and 30, uh, it says he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. And so on multiple occasions, whenever Paul started to preach, when he started preaching Jesus and showing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Jews couldn't take it. You know, Paul thought, surely they'll accept me. They know who I am, but they wouldn't. They saw him as a traitor. And here we see that same thing happening again in Jerusalem. They see him as a traitor and they're ready to kill him. He said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And here's where they go from listening, and they've calmed themselves down from having beat him. Here's where they go from listening to him to they turn back into that angry mob that they were just a little bit before. Verse 22, they listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and follow, uh, throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging, so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you out to do? This man's a Roman. The commander said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. And the commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that Paul was a Roman because he had put him in chains. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered, him, ordered the chief priests and the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. And so the Jews turn on Paul again. They listen, listen to him up to the point that he mentioned the Gentiles, and then they went completely insane. They start throwing their cloaks off. They're throwing dust up in the air, and they start shouting again, he needs to be put to death. They mentioned the Gentile, uh, the mention of the Gentiles reignited their hatred for Paul because of their hatred for the Gentiles. At this point, the commander's had enough and he's going to try to get the truth out of Paul in a different way. What exactly is going on here? So he has Paul tied up. He's about to have him scourged. Uh, now remember, that's the, the, the type of beating that, that Pilate subjected Jesus to before the crucifixion. Scourging was a particularly harsh and cruel punishment where leather straps were attached to a handle with pieces of bone and metal embedded at the other end. Uh, and the, the prisoner, whoever was being subjected to it, would be whipped with it and it would rip open whatever part of the body it hit, often to the point of exposing internal organs. Many who were scourged were, uh, were left crippled for life and it even killed some. And so they were getting ready to to subject Paul to about the harshest punishment they could give just short of death. 
and even potentially death, depending on how carried away they got with the scourging. But then Paul opens his mouth up. He asks one question. And now instead of being the one who's being tortured, you, you might say he's kind of torturing the other ones. Now, hey, I'm a Roman. You aren't supposed to tie me up like this. He kind of turns the tables on him and they, they begin to get afraid because they weren't supposed to tie him up. They weren't supposed to do this sort of thing to him as a Roman citizen. Roman citizens had certain rights that others didn't. It was against the law to bind and beat a Roman citizen. Everyone there knew it. Roman citizens had rights that not everyone enjoyed. One of them was that they would be spared from the harshest of punishments. Uh, Roman citizens also had the right to appeal to the emperor, which we'll see a little bit later on in the book of Acts in our study. The commander was now in a bind because he had a Roman citizen in custody. He had no idea what he was being charged with. <coughs> the Jews couldn't tell him. When he asked, it was just confusion. And his attempt to find out by letting Paul uh, speak yielded no helpful results. And so when the commander made another attempt to figure it out by beating him, he couldn't do that. And so the next, what we'll see when we get into chapter 23, he brings the chief priests and the council together. And he's going to put Paul before them and try to find out in a different way. But we're going to leave it right there at the end of chapter 22. Let's finish up our, our class this morning with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, be dismissed. Our dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for allowing us to, to gather as your people to learn from your word. And Father, we uh, thank you for the message that we, we see in the book of Acts, Father, and pray that we would learn from it. Father, I pray that uh, as we see what... Uh, as we see Paul's method and the way that he speaks to others, I pray that we would be willing to, to speak the truth even whenever it might lead to mistreatment or when it's unpopular. Um, and Father, I pray that, that we would be a people that, that, that put your mission first, regardless of how the world sees, uh, sees your word and regardless of how the world looks at us, Father, I pray that we would uh, continue to have the, uh, the love of Jesus towards those around us uh, and strive to bring more people to you. Father, I pray that, uh, that you would continue to go with us through this morning as we have our, our services coming up in just a few minutes, and I pray that, uh, uh, that we would strive, uh, continue to strive to learn more about you and to, to, uh, to be more like Christ. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.